my name is Mohammed Mohammed. Well, um, you know, I'm originally from, from Africa, especially uh, Somalia, but, you know, I was raised through a few other different countries like Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, I lived in Malawi. But then I had the opportunity of coming to the, to the States in 2004 as a refugee and I uh, ended up in San Diego, California. That was my first location. I came at the age of, I just, I just turned 18 then. Um, I remember, you know, the hardest thing for me was, of course, the language. So luckily, uh, you know, I didn't see the war myself. I was, it happened when I was alive, but I was too young to remember. But, you know, stories of the family, you know, it affected a lot of people in the family. And uh, in the refugee, I mean, I lived seven years of my life, I lived in a refugee camp. Um, you know, we went one country to the next, to the next. Finally, we stayed in a refugee camp for seven years. Then after that, we traveled back to Kenya and how we ended up in, 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 uh, in the States. The water, man, water, that's, uh, you know, it's like people don't take it serious. And I remember as a kid, you know, I think the first time in my life that we had running water in our house, where I, I think I was like maybe 16, 17 years of age. Before that, it was always like going out there, getting our water, sitting on a line or putting a bucket on a line that you wait for like 24 hours to sit there and wait, 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 wait until the next day so you can get your chance. So water is a commodity. And uh, I remember, you know, waking up sometimes. This is, up like, this is like five years in the States. I remember I would wake up in the morning and thinking, oh, do we have water? You know, that was like the first thing in my mind before thinking anything else. Then I, you know, I tried different jobs, but then I said, you know what, again, because of how I am, I said, you know, business is a great way. So I've always been in the transportation business. That's where my majority of my time. So I always had a pen in my pocket. And then when I'll talk to people in my car, they would say certain words that I don't understand. I would write them down. Then I'll go home and then look on my computer, you know, and I'll Google them and say, like, what is this word? And that's how actually it taught me a lot, you know, um, I wanted to get in this industry for a while and had a chance to get in the industry, um, the behavioral health industry. And luckily I met Sister Jessica and we did speak about other, um, you know, opportunities in the industry that we could, we could help, you know? Um, it's either the clinical side of it or the behavior home side of it or the outreach, you know, going out there, and, you know, uh, doing different things for the community. So to me, I, and, and that was like an advantage. I had families who was dealing with alcohol, and you can imagine, you know, me growing up, and I, I've always thought, you know, because because what happens is that a lot of times is that these people were shut them down. They would just close them. Like people didn't want to help them out because because it was like it was a taboo, you know, if you and because we, in our communities, like you know, people didn't drink a lot. And then if you drink and usually most people who become alcoholic, they would have fights and stuff like that. So people will keep them, push them away. And then it was like a hole. A lot of times it's in a hole they're getting in. So when I, look, when I look back, I mean, it has an effect on me. You know, where to see somebody, maybe they just needed help. I needed guidance. They needed somebody to understand and say, look, yes, we know what you're going through. You know, we can help you out. You know, like, well, like when I speak to Sister Jessica, it always tells me she didn't, she didn't get that help or she knew people that actually would actually use that help today, they're not even around because those services were, were not there. You know, our goal is actually to go out there and people to know what we do so we can provide help, making sure that people are inspired, people can, can, can understand, look, whatever you're dealing with, there's people that we're here to get to help you. And we, you know, because why? Because a lot of people who are here have went through those stuff. So we'll, we'll guide you, help you, and hopefully you can conquer and change your life through that. Uh, the staff, if there's no staff, we, right, there's no client, literally, I mean, the staff are the backbone of this place, right, and, I've, and each staff that we have so far are, you know, <laughs> it's like they are sold in, right, and because they, they love what they do, and I, and, I, and I speak this from my heart, they love what they do, you know, they, they understand their clients, a lot of them have went through what the clients have went through themselves. 
so they open-minded you know they they they, uh, they even if you ask the clients I've, I've asked a couple clients and they tell me they said I've never seen a group of staff it's like it's this caring or this understanding or this kind of knowledgeable of what what, what we actually went through in, my, in our lives so I'm really, I'm really happy with the people that we have and each level is each person is different right and we've seen this we've seen a client that can be here for six months and a client can be here for three months and the outcome is different because I feel like and even if they walk out and then they leave and get a job and stuff like that, they always still need that service. And a lot of them will tell you, I've been sober for like a year, two years, three years, and I still need that. Once a month, twice a month, maybe once a week, whatever they need, they come back to us. It's Jessica Lee Marie Stanford. I am the executive director here. I am one of the other owners here. I am multiracial. I have Irish in me. I have Italian in me, I have Native American in me, and of course I have, I'm also African American. So I like to say I mix with every good thing underneath the sun. Growing up in a household where a majority of the adults were drinking, a majority of youth was drinking, I also started drinking at a very young age. I was about nine or ten years old the first time I um, drank alcohol and it was whiskey and I remember sneaking it out of my mother's um, kitchen and I started drinking it and then from there I started doing marijuana when I was about 13 14 years old and then by the time I hit 1920 and then I also got hooked on math when I was about 20 years old. And so drinking at a young age was a way for me to escape my home life. The yelling, the cursing, the, um, you know, a little bit of abuse that was taking place. That was a way for me to escape. So I struggled. So the thing is, I struggled with depression growing up. Feeling unloved, feeling unwanted. Um, and so... I had a lot of self-hate about myself. I also suffered um, molestation at a young age that really, again, made me feel low. Like it was my fault and I just, I hated my body, hated everything about myself. So by the time I became a, a preteen, again, 12, 13 years old, I started self-harming. So I was a cutter. And I would do, the, I would just do that as a means to take my mind off of things. So it's not a surprise, not surprising that I got pregnant at a young age. I got pregnant with my oldest daughter when I was 17 years old. And my mind was like, listen, I just need a place to stay. <laughs> you know, I'll do what I need to do. And eventually I also started working. So now I'm a functional alcoholic. I ended up dating a wrong individual. And he worked at the restaurant that I worked at. He was an older gentleman, but I was struggling with my addiction severely. And so I went to his apartment to party. That night, he apparently didn't have any money for his drugs. So he ended up using me to cover his end of it. And let me tell you, Grandma Peters, oh my goodness, she had 11 kids. She was Italian. She was a Great Depression baby. So she has seen her fair share of struggles. And I remember her looking at, not even looking, she was in her bed and she yelled my name. She said, Jessica. And when she called my name, I immediately started fixing my hair, fixing my clothes. And I'm walking in and I'm like, yes. And I'm walking into the house and I peeped my hair, not my whole body because I was rough. I just peeped my head in. And I said, yes, Grandma Peters. And she said, I want you to know that your baby cried for you all night. And the moment she said that, it was like my heart sank into my stomach. What do you mean all night? Because my daughter always slept throughout the night. And she's like, she called all night. So fear hit in. Because it's like, what was going on? Did something happen to my daughter? So while I'm thinking about the worst case scenario, I'm also reminding myself that I wasn't in position as a mother to care for my daughter because I was across the other way, getting drunk and getting high. She looked so sweet and so innocent 
that I ended up just falling on my knees. And then I remember the creator, God say to me, put in my spirit that if I didn't stop my cycle, then this same thing is gonna affect my daughter. And that's when I was like, yeah, I can't do this no more. And I gave my life back to Christ at that particular moment. And that was in June of 2005. And that was actually the last time I ever touched drugs. I, I didn't touch meth or anything like that. Being partnered up with Not My Kid, I was able and felt encouraged and, and empowered to go around sharing my story. So now I find myself in the school system at the college level, high school level, elementary level, talking about my life and my experiences, saying, hey, here's the resources. If you have a problem, call me. Let me help navigate them to other agencies that's out there. Because in the back of my mind, the last thing I ever wanted for somebody to feel like me, to feel helpless. You, you cry out to God like somebody come save me, help me, you know? And that's the worst feeling ever, to feel like you, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. So the idea of Aspire really boiled down to like my lifelong of experiences. Going into the streets, finding these women who were going through domestic violence, who was, who was hooking on the streets or having addiction, helping getting them off the street, getting them cleaned up, getting them placed in different agencies that would care for them mentally, physically, and emotionally, and definitely spiritually, helping our men in the community to help teach our men what it means to be a man, teach our women what it means to be a woman, and try to build up the family. That's where the name Aspire came from because I always remember Grandma Peters. She's an individual that inspired me to be clean. I, um, My heart and my job is really just to create a program for our clients, that people that come in, rather you are dealing with addiction, rather you're dealing with alcoholism, mental illness, wherever the case may be. We have courses for you to take to help strengthen you, strengthen you individually. Um, if you just need resources for food boxes, we got you. Because we're also a community service, a community center. So our nonprofit is here. So for people that need food boxes, if people need needing assistance with housing, job placement, whatever the case may be, we got you. Our focus here is to stop systematic oppression as well as depression. We want people to know that they have a place in this community, that they are able to be effective, that they are able to um, not only care for themselves, but have people that are gonna care for you too. It's a community, we partner up. Our job at Aspire as employees is to help you as an individual become self-sufficient because we know that if you could be stronger as a person, then that means when you go back to your family, you're gonna help strengthen your family. By strengthening your family, you're gonna strengthen your community. And then that's it right there. We become stronger as a people. The thing is that yes, it may take a village to raise a kid, but it takes a community to repair an adult. And so here at Aspire, we are, we really want to be that village for our kids and we want to be that community for our adults. You know, it's never too old to learn new ways to be self-sufficient and independent. I see Aspire going into our prison systems, so I don't never want anybody to come across our path thinking that it's over, right? Thinking that their best has already came now. So I really see Aspire um, branch out in the community and create other programs that will be able to positively impact our, our, our criminal justice system, our school system, the medical system. You see what I'm saying? I see us working with our governments as well because these are programs that's needed. They are needed, you know. Um, it's not easy to speak up when you feel like you're drowning but I commend every person that does because you, you don't want to be judged. That's what we are here for. We're a 24-hour crisis center. So it doesn't matter at any day, at any given time. We are here to support any individual that needs it. That's what we are here to do.